Welcome to Midlife Matters. I'm Marie, and each week I'm joined by my friends Julie and Mindy to talk about all the topics keeping women in the middle years up at night. Today we're talking about the hard parts of life. What do we do when we experience struggles and trials? Where do we go for wisdom and comfort? How can we help friends who are walking through a difficult season? Join us as Mindy and Julie share some hard things that have been going on in their lives. Listeners, today's episode is a little different in that we don't have one specific topic. We wanted to record today to catch you up on some things that have been going on in our lives. If you've been listening to Midlife Matters for a while, then you know that we try to approach every topic with a strong sense of reality, but also encouragement. And we try to always end on a note that brings you up. One of the things we're amazed by, and we certainly deeply appreciate, is that so many of you tell us that we're your friends. Even though we've never met, you hear us each week and have gotten to know us, and you feel a part of the conversation. And we're so thrilled by that. We are really honored that Midlife Matters truly lives up to its mission of being a place to provide encouragement to women in the middle years. And one thing that we've talked about many times is that in friendship, sometimes you have to move beyond the surface to really know someone. And sometimes you have to enter into the hard parts of their life really listen, and provide whatever support you can. So both Mindy and Julie are going to share some things that are going on in their lives because we see our listeners as our friends and because you'll hear about this and it impacts how and what we'll talk about in the future. So Mindy, we're just going to get started by that today. And I wanted to just lead off with what do you want to share with listeners today? Well, I think that I've been um, very open about maybe the bigger details of my life. I think I've shared um, pretty openly about our many moves as a family, and we've joked about that quite a lot with the podcast, but I don't think um, I've ever shared the why we've moved even in the past um, couple of years. So I think I'm just going to give you a little testimony of this season that my family has been in the past couple of years. When we moved up to Pennsylvania in 2018, that's when our podcast started. And so our listeners have been able to um, follow along as we were signing on for a big new adventure up in the Northeast. I'd never been there before. We moved from a very large home in Knoxville, Tennessee. We moved into a small three-bedroom townhome and really just waited to um, sell our house in Tennessee to be able to buy a home in Pennsylvania and have this great adventure. Um, In the meantime, I turned 40. We were really just struggling to um, have Abby move out. She was a freshman in college in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we had to leave her behind. And that was just the most difficult part of that journey. Into our second year in Pennsylvania, we were thrilled to be able to buy a home, get settled, meet neighbors, meet friends. Some of the rough edges were kind of wearing off. And then, as we all know, in March 2020, COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And I will say Bryce was hired on with a new hospital system up in Pennsylvania. And when we were hired on, they were in the acquiring phase. Well, like so many out there, they never had a chance to recoup any of that money that they spent in the acquiring phase. And so when COVID hit and they started losing money daily, um, we knew that the situation was becoming dire. And so in June 2020, we weren't surprised at all that we were one of the families that were affected by the many layoffs in the Mm. hospital system. Mm -hmm. What goes through your mind when your husband comes home without a job? I'm not the only one that's dealt with this. (laughs) Right, right. Um, It wasn't something I was ready to fully delve into and share. But I mean, there's so many things that go through your mind. In one way, we were relieved. We were fearful. Why? What did we do? Could we change anything? Where does that leave us? It is a weird existence for sure for your husband to not be at work when you're used to him being at work. You look at yourself and you look at him and your family very differently because that's a major identity source for all of you. And it's stripped away. And when that's stripped away, you just, you kind of wonder where does that leave us? With COVID, with losing his job, We just knew that we had been very isolated up north. And so honestly, we thought the first thing we thought was if we can sell our house, we're moving back to where we're familiar, back to Knoxville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And so we put our house on the market actually just days after Bryce came home without a job and it sold by that weekend. And so praise the Lord, Mm -hmm. the house sold and we quickly moved back south. 
my emotions were so raw during this time. I had never moved before without a job. The job had always led where we went. And this was the first time in our journey that it didn't. And it was also the third time in three years that we had moved. Mm -hmm. And I was very weary. I was tired. Um, It was really hard. I I would love to say that, you know, it's a time where you're like, oh, we're going to have a great time together. But, you know, how do you tackle your emotions daily when you're concerned about the future, when you're fearful about the future? So when the boys, thankfully, they were able to go back to school in August and Bryce stayed home. I was not okay with that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, that's hard. I mean, yeah, your your husband being home and out of a job is a constant reminder of the situation that you're in. It is. And it's like, okay, I, I know I love this man, but he's always here. And, you know, it's like one day I'd be excited for him to be home. The next I'd be completely irritated because I didn't know how long it would last. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I didn't know how long we would be in that season. However, Bryce was completely at peace. Um, He's completely joyful. He didn't seem to struggle like I did. And he happily filled his days with working out with our son in the morning, meeting friends for lunch. He even learned how to cook. And, Mm -hmm. but all the while just actively looking and interviewing for jobs. I mean, constantly looking, interviewing, applying. So I will say as much as we really enjoyed moving back to a place that was familiar, a place that we call home, um, hard to handle everyone when your husband doesn't have a job because like you're living this daily struggle and it was really hard for others to know how to handle it. So we as a family, the longer he was home, the more we got used to him being at home and the boys at school and, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of uh, stationing out our time. Um, We started actually seeing this time as a sabbatical. We started seeing it as a time of rest, a time of renewal, joy, laughter, reconnecting with old friends, being part of our church here again for in-person services. I've mentioned before how much that meant. And we got to start seeing our daughter again as much as we wanted. And then she got engaged and we're here. Like we, we actually are able to be here for this season of life, this small period of time where she's planning her wedding and things like that. Mm-hmm. But ironically, though, like when you tell others your story, they have questions and they have their own concerns. They look at you <laughs> And it's really hard to see pity in your friend's eyes. It's Mm. really hard Mm -hmm. to see pity in your family's eyes because they look at you and it's like you can feel the questions. What Mm -hmm. what did he do wrong? What's Mm. what's wrong with Bryce? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. uh, why did this happen? Well, what are you doing about it? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Right. And, And I hate to say that that sounds really harsh, but at the same time, it's like you're struggling. Um. You're struggling with your own emotions. And and I felt like we were doing our very best to kneel before the Father. We're journaling. We're praying. We're seeking the Lord. We're relying on on Scripture and memorizing Scripture. And, um, and then it's really hard because it's like we're giving our anxiety to the Lord. And those around us that love us have their own anxiety for us because Mm -hmm. they're worried about us. And, and so it's really hard to kind of combat that. You are a very cheerful person, Mindy. And so I'm picturing that if people talk to you, they may not get the sense that you are appropriately concerned and understand (laughs) the brevity of this situation, you know, maybe. No, you're right, Marie. And um, I, I wish, I wish I could read to you the gamut of emotions that my journal goes through because there are days like what the way the Lord sold our house full on praising amazed at what he did. And there's another day where I was so desperate and I wrote, Lord, I need to see you today. And that night Bryce says, come look outside, Mindy. And I walk out the back door and there is the most brilliant rainbow I have ever seen in my life. And I'm in the middle of it. It's spanning our yard from one end Mm -hmm. to the next. I've never seen colors so brilliant in the sky before. And the Lord said, I see you. 
Mm, so mm-hmm. you see me and I know that rainbow was for me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And so there are, there are days of great anguish and there were days of questions and sorrows and bickering between Bryce and I, you know, times where I'm like, this just isn't supposed to be how it is. And Bryce would say, well, what do you want me to do? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm right. doing everything I can. I'm doing everything I can. And the Lord has us here. And, um, and so people don't see that they don't Mm -hmm. see the burden and the struggle you constantly carry. They don't see the stigma that you feel when you say we're looking for a job Mm -hmm. and, and you do feel it. Um, and so it was, it was one of those daily giving that back over to the Lord daily surrender. I remember just this one time, and if I'm completely honest about my snarkiness, I was like, look, I gave over my anxiety to the Lord. I'm going to need you to do the same thing. (laughs) 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 Please don't ask me any questions. I can't handle it today. And then there's other times where I, in full faith, oh yes, the Lord is working and we don't have any answers. And you know what? We're just, we're doing the best we can every day. (laughs) Right. That's so true. It's like you're, you're giving your own heart over to God and he's changing it. But if it's not happening around you, it's like, gosh, I can only be responsible for so many people. (laughs) I know. I know. I know. I'm like, I'm going to need you to carry your own burden because I'm really like doing the very best I can to surrender my, my burden. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, Mindy, did you ever feel mad at God? Like, why is this happening again? Why am I moving again? Why was I sent up to Pennsylvania just for this short detour? Like you said, you moved three times in three years. I feel like I might be throwing up my hands with why? Yes, it it was. Um, I have again, I have journal entries of full on praise. And then not even a week later, I can read to you my very bitter, very angry journal entry. Um, there are so many emotions or like the waves in the sea. And, Mm -hmm. and so that's why we had a lot of hope. We had a lot of excitement about our journey up North and, um, even buying the house when Bryce came home without a job, we ended up selling it exactly one year later. Um, Mm -hmm. we were in that house only one year and that didn't, it doesn't make sense. It Mm -hmm. wasn't what we had planned when we moved up there. We had hoped that our youngest Nathaniel, who was in fifth grade, would graduate from high school from there. We actually did not plan to uproot the kids again. And mm-hmm. so my mom heart is like, you know, are my kids going to be completely messed up? Like, what are people going to think? Here we are right. moving again. Like, what's up with these nomads? Yeah, I can see how that would be a concern. I mean, I think too, like when we go through these things, we're also we're disappointed for ourselves. And then we're also struggling with what does it mean for my kids? And so I imagine, you know, your heart was heavy for how this is impacting your kids too. Very much so. I want us to be a strong, happy, healthy family. And when you think about kind of like how a family should look, you just, you think like dad's got a job. Maybe mom has a job too. Maybe mom's at home. Maybe, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the kids go to school or, you know, and it's like, that's the normal. Mm -hmm. And anytime you don't fit in the normal, you Mm -hmm. just feel weird. Like you feel like there's something wrong with you and you don't quite fit in society or normal society because you have something that makes you different. Ironically, um, we didn't know how long or what the season would be like at the beginning. And it's funny because one of the verses that I wrote right after Bryce came home from being let go was Psalm 27, 14. And it was wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And I find, I found that ironic. I was like, Lord, are you telling me something? Like, is this going to take a while? (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) And Again, like looking for a job, anyone who's been in this type of season, um, it's very daily and there's, there's a lot of emotions each day. There's a lot of, there's so much calling, talking with your network. Bryce is constantly applying for jobs. We're looking for jobs. He's interviewing. And then there's so much waiting because you could interview and never hear anything. You can Mm -hmm. apply and never hear anything. 
you have hope on Monday morning that maybe this week could be the week, you know, that you kind of start seeing what is going to happen with your family in the future. And then on Friday, the closer it gets to 5 p.m. and you know that business is dying down, Mm -hmm. this dread sets in and you're like, you start dreading the weekends because you Mm -hmm. know that no decisions are going to be made. Nobody's going to call you over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And so it's really hard because this almost depression sets in on Friday night. And you're like, but now the kids are home and now Mm. it's family time. And -hmm. now we're celebrating, you know, Abby's engagement. And now, you know, like you're constantly waffling between joyful things and your emotions. And it's like those dark, dreadful emotions are just under the surface Mm -hmm. because you don't know. Mm -hmm. You just, you're living with it. And you have to find a way to live. And another verse that, um, the Lord, I felt like was just really put a bit in my mouth and was like one day at a time is Matthew six thirty four, And it's don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worry itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. But then in John sixteen thirty three, he says in this world, you will have trouble. It's, it's a fact, but he says, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And so I felt like each day it was life giving. I had to have the time journaling and getting out all the negative emotions and then taking in the Lord's promises and, and having that for the day. And it was just enough for the day. It was my daily bread Mm -hmm. and his grace is sufficient. It doesn't mean it takes everything away. It just means he is with you. One of the testimonies I would like to share, though, is we came to find in this season that we were really um, full of gratitude for the things that we started to see that the Lord was doing in Knoxville, the friends that we were reconnecting with, the rest that we felt, family that was coming through to see us more often, seeing Abby more often, her fiance, seeing Grant more often, having a season that there's so much unexpected joys that have happened that we would have never had, had we not had the season of sabbatical, the season of rest, seeing it as such a special time, even me working at DW and the friends that we have had. And just recently, uh, we've lost one of our best friends and it was, it was unexpected. It was sudden. And we wouldn't have had that time with him and his wife and family, had we not been here these past months. Mm -hmm. And there was one day that I asked Jacob and Nathan, I was taking them to school and I said, Hey, are you guys still praying for your dad to get a job? And Nathan just, um, pipes up and he said, Oh, I forgot dad didn't have a job. Mm. And Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) that was just, I came home and I told Bryce about it and it was so telling to me Mm -hmm. because you heard one of the worries I had was, are my kids going to be messed up? Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) are they okay? Right. And they had no fear. Like, they, they were completely just had a, they have a solid foundation. And even though we have moved a lot, they weren't worried whatsoever. And, and so I'm truly thankful for that. To me, that is a testimony of this time. I'd love to just be able to also just tell you, like, praise the Lord. Seven months after we left the North, um, we've just accepted a job in LaGrange, Georgia. Mm, so mm-hmm. that's exciting, Mindy. We, yeah. But you're moving again. <laughs> <laughs> so I've beat my old record. I'm. I, this will be the fourth move in four years, and it sounds really exhausting when I say that. But at the same time, we do really feel that the Lord has answered um, our prayers of this next place that we're going to go. Even the day that Bryce was interviewing for this job, I heard him laughing, like hysterically laughing. And he's interviewing. Mm. And I'm like, what is going on in there? I Mm -hmm. was trying to do laundry. And it kept going. And so I finally sat down because I wanted to listen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he was having such a good time on the interview. I actually got my journal out and I wrote, thank you, Lord, for this gift of an interview. If nothing else comes of this what a gift for today that he is laughing and encouraged and had a great time interviewing because mm-hmm. most of them are not that way. Right. <laughs> no. Right. 
praise the Lord, that's Bryce's new boss, that man he was laughing with hysterically. Mm -hmm. And he just, every time he talks to his new boss, he lights up, his face lights up. And that says something to me. And so I'm thankful for the answer to our prayers um, for a job, but I don't want to miss the seven months that the Lord gave us, the seven months that he set aside for this, this time, for this season. Like I said, it's not what I would have planned. There's a lot more mood involved, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's just, it's just been a, such a sweet season. So now we're just looking at another transition. We're rejoicing. We're looking ahead. We're starting to look at houses. I'm praying for new friends, a new community, a new church, um, things like that. And so it's just, it's just overwhelming the different things that are happening simultaneously. So I think I'd like to end with one of my journal entries. It's very short. And it was right after we found out about the job. And I had been reading um, in Luke. And Luke 2.19 just says, Mary treasured these things in her heart. And I'm just shortening that. But what I wrote that day was, Lately, I feel such overwhelming emotion at all the Lord is providing for our family. I often feel I am savoring the moment and trying to grasp it and hold on. I know change is constant, though, so while it may be futile, I grasp anyway, so that maybe my mind and heart will remember. The world is hurting, and I feel full to overflowing with great joy. 2020 has brought a clarity and simple quality of life that is better than so many prior years. Mm, mm-hmm. So that was right after Bryce lost his job? That that was written right after we found out about the new job. Oh, right after you found out about the new job. Okay. Yeah. That's and and you're holding both, you know, you're holding hard things yes. that have happened the year and good things that have happened. And I didn't want and I know you you might be glossing over this for our listeners, but I want them to know that it hurts your heart to have to leave Knoxville again. You went there wanting to connect with your friends. You love that place. You've talked before on the podcast how of all the places you've ever lived, you considered Knoxville your home. So it's not like you're just looking forward to the future. You're also mourning having to leave behind a place that you truly do love. We do. And I would be remiss um, if I didn't say that probably the first two or three months of living back in Knoxville Probably the first couple of weeks just standing in church again on a Sunday morning with our friends, I just wept. I -hmm. wept at being in the house of the Lord again. I wept at being in community again. Anyone who's ever been in isolation can understand when you're back or when you feel loved or when you're, you know, around those people again that make you feel that, Mm -hmm. how overwhelming those emotions can be. And also in the same breath, begging God to make it last, make it stay, Mm -hmm. and also surrendering Mm -hmm. and saying, I'm going to trust you. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes saying that um, before I believed it. My my Mm. heart takes longer to catch up, but I I say that and I believe it and I'm going to keep saying it until my heart catches up because he is the only truth we have to hold on to Mm -hmm. and he knows better. He knows better than Mindy. And that's really hard for me to remember. He actually loves my kids more than I do, which I have to remind myself of because I wouldn't do the things that he's done. And I feel like in my humanness, I love them so much, but he loves them more. One of the other truths that I I journaled, it's very short, but it's the Lord's plans may include us, but they aren't necessarily about us. Mm. And even though we're walking this journey and have walked this journey and are, you know, going on to our next journey. The Lord is using this in each of my kids' lives in a different way than I can possibly imagine. He's using this in the people's lives that we're around. And that's why I'm sharing this testimony, because I know that he wants to use even what we're going through to help someone else. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what what I I wanted to say, Minnie, thank you for sharing, because I think one of the hardest things when a trial hits is our surprise at it Mm. is we're so shocked. And like you said, there will be trouble in our world and that we all suffer. And 
we act like, why, you know, how could this happen? Why is it happening? And you aren't abnormal, you know? And I think that's what people need to hear is that that is normal. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you, Julie. And thanks for letting me share. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing with us and our listeners. Julie, I know that you're going through a trial right now that you're going to share with listeners. Yeah. um, About four weeks ago, um, John and I were sitting in church uh, at the start of a new hopeful year, 2021. And, um, you know, we had normal concerns just like everybody else, but nothing unusual. And I looked over at him. And his coloring just didn't look right. Like he looked kind of jaundiced and I didn't say anything, but I just kept finding myself staring at him through the whole service. And um, so when we got out, I said, I think you look a little yellow, like something's just not right. He immediately got concerned and that is not like him Mm. uh, to get concerned over medical things. And so when we got home, he texted his doctor and said, I think I want to come in tomorrow. just mm-hmm. get this checked out. And uh, when he got there, his doctor couldn't even tell he was jaundiced. Like, but he said, I always trust a family member because they know they mm. can just see the subtle changes, you know. Mm-hmm. So he ran some blood work and uh, sent him, you know, I think either John went on to work or whatever. You know, it was just at the at the end of the day. And he said, I'll call you with the results. Well, um, that night, John woke up in yeah, like three or four in the morning in a lot of pain. And he had gotten a shower and gotten dressed and woke me up and said, I'm driving myself to the ER. And I said, I flew out of bed and said, well, I'm coming with you. And he goes, no, 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 no. Just you stay in bed. I feel okay to drive. He goes, but I bet you I'm getting my gallbladder out today. And so I just went back to sleep. (laughs) I mean, Mm -hmm. I just Mm -hmm. really was not, you know, he texted me that he made it there. And a couple hours later, he texted me and said, well, why don't you come on to the hospital whenever you feel like it? And I thought that was a little unusual. So I called him and we were talking. And he just said, Julie, it's a pancreatic cancer. And I I just said, no, no. You know, I, I, I couldn't believe that I was hearing those words. And I'm sorry. No, we're not going to be able to get through this <laughs> without tears. Uh-uh. Um, you know, he, if, for those that don't know, he's a radiologist. So he asked the technician to turn the monitor so he could see it. And he's, and he saw it, he saw it himself. Mm. And he said, I hoped it was something else. I hoped, you know, he got some of his, I mean, he, his doctor looked at it and, and some of his partners and mm-hmm. it was just undeniable. Like, you know, mm. they all knew. And by the time I got there, this was at the hospital he works at for, you know, for 15 years. And everybody I saw just said, Oh my goodness, Julie, I'm so sorry. You know, like this, the gravity of it hit, like I didn't even really know what I was walking into and I Mm -hmm. could just tell by their responses. Um, And it's stage four pancreatic cancer. So that means it has spread to other, like it's in his small intestine and his liver, um, which typically doesn't have, you know, a good, good prognosis. Um, you know, I think we had just recorded things we want to try in 2021, literally days before this. Mm-hmm. Right. And now I can't tell you what one of those things was. Right. Uh, well, I can tell you one <laughs> that we're, we're reading through the Bible and we actually are doing that together and mm-hmm. we're still doing that. Um, but it's, I mean, just in that one moment, our entire life changed forever. and. I can't tell you much about before, you know, like what, what my plans were because none of that seems to matter anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, and then, and then the days that followed that, um, we were in the hospital. He had three or four procedures under general anesthesia, like in three days. It was, mm-hmm. it was crazy. Um, he, but people were visiting like all, and not people couldn't visit from without the hospital, you know, vi- friends, but all of his colleagues and peers and, technicians mm-hmm. and nurses and doctors were coming in his room and he was just, I don't know, we were kind of on like this, you know, uh, this high of like just constant interaction. People were, were just there constantly. And, um, and then we came home and it kind of set in at that point, I think, mm-hmm. um, you know, what life was going to be like. 
Um, but he was um, given a, a great opportunity to be in a phase one drug trial where he'll receive standard chemotherapy, standard care chemotherapy for pancreatic cancer and two additional um, clinical trial drugs. Mm -hmm. And he was so grateful for that because um, his oncologist is one of the top GI cancer oncologists in the country, and she has access to these trials. Um, not every oncologist would. So we really felt blessed that he didn't have to seek treatment in another city, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that it was right here um, because he, you know, he wants to be be with us as much as, as he can. So we yeah. were very grateful for that. Yeah. Well, Julie, when you found out, what do you feel in that moment? Are you angry? Are you like, what, how do you feel? Like, I don't know. I just always go to, how do you feel as a Christian? Because I always think, well, <laughs> how would I react? Like, what is my initial thought? Yeah, I don't think you could even imagine what, what your initial thought would be until you're in it. But, um, you know, a lot of people have asked me that. And I've talked a lot about that because um, I think kindly God had allowed me to go through a crisis of belief several years ago, mm -hmm. actually up until maybe six months ago, working all through that, starting six years ago with my daughter moving very far away. Um, just this last year, our son going through a very unexpected divorce, mm -hmm. COVID, mm -hmm. a friend nearly dying of COVID, watch, you know, walking through that with his wife. And then my mom's fall that resulted in hip replacement surgery and rehab in another state. And mm -hmm. then now this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, knowing you, you've been hit by one thing after another. Yeah. But I can honestly look back now and see how the Lord had prepared me for this. Not that I thought something bad was going to happen, but I can just see how he's corrected lies that I believed about him and misunderstandings about him. And had I'm very thankful for that because had I been going through that crisis now, I wouldn't make it. Mm -hmm. You know, like with, with news this devastating, I, I just wouldn't make it without a full trust in God. Mm -hmm. And you know how you say or even feel like you believe something in your head, but and really until you have to live it out, you really never know mm -hmm. what the condition of your heart is. You really don't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, long before I really understood what suffering was about, I kind of thought it was sad if somebody went through a crisis of belief, like, like their faith should be stronger or, or God should be better or something, you know, like, but I think you would have to be totally unhuman mm -hmm. to not go through one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And God is okay with that. Like, mm -hmm. he's okay with our doubts. He's okay with our anger. But the key is to stay engaged in conversation with him. He can handle it. Um, it's when we walk away that, you know, that we bring more suffering on ourselves. And in my case, I know that no matter how much I wanted to walk away in the last five years and curse God, uh, deep down, I always knew that I couldn't or that I wouldn't. And I know that was God holding on to me because he doesn't change. He doesn't forsake us. It's only us that walk away. Mm -hmm. You know, everything in life happens because we live in, in a broken world. It makes, you know, not as it's intended to be at all. Mm -hmm. And God never orchestrates things in our lives with the intent of luring us away from him. Of course not. He always roots for us to move closer to him. And I have definitely felt that in this trial. And um, now I can't say that I haven't cried in anger. I haven't been disappointed that I have not questioned God, but I don't settle there anymore. Mm -hmm. I pass through those stages quickly. Whereas Years ago, I think I would have just stuck there, and it would have been a very hard place to get out of. Mm -hmm. Another thing I'd like to mention is just acceptance. Um, the secret to living and suffering is acceptance, not a different set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have been saying that for the last couple of years. I think I've said that on this podcast through different different things, that changing your circumstances isn't going to change your ability to find peace and to find joy. Um, we all suffer. And, you know, suffering, I think, 
that's such a, an ugly word, but we all have things in our life that we wish weren't there. Mm-hmm. Or we all have things that we desire that we don't have, or, or at some point we will. Mm-hmm. And that's what suffering is. And um, really, I think our response to that is all that really matters. And in the past, my response to suffering had sometimes been anger at the, quote, unfairness of it all, or or bitterness, or blaming God, and even finally, kind of a resignation, a fatalism, like, okay, God, I'll accept this and want what you want instead of what I want. You know, like it still wasn't at a place of Mm -hmm. true surrender. Right. Um, Or I was responding in busyness or distracting myself from my real heart issues. And yeah, I've been reading through the Bible chronologically with the Bible recap. And that was one of the things I wanted to do in 2021. And right when this happened, I think we were still in Genesis. We had finished Job and we were in Genesis. And Mm -hmm. You know, if God apportions all of the all of our experiences in life, some of us just just like the Israelites did, responded in faith, and some of the Israelites just like us won't respond that way. And God was not happy with most of them, you know, by their response. Right. And I just know now that I want my response to please Him, and that is not something that has been. Um, a concern of mine in the past. <laughs> it's mm. been more about my rights, my wants, my desires. Mm-hmm. And honestly, sharing this helps me be accountable. I think on days when my beliefs and my feelings don't line up, mm-hmm. because that is on that is a lot of days. Your beliefs and your feelings do not line up. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so that it kind of keeps me pointed in the right direction. Another thing that's kind of changed is prayer. Um, I don't understand it, but I do it. And I, of course, pray and I ask people to pray for healing for John, whether that be God supernaturally touching him, speaking over him, or through a drug trial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, But prayer is definitely a mystery. And I have been reading a lot of Elizabeth Elliot uh, lately. And um, I love what she said. She said, um, you know, people constantly question prayer, like, well, can we really change the mind of God? Or it doesn't matter how we pray or when we pray. And she said, all I know is that prayer is how spiritual things have been set up to work. Just like in the physical world, gravity causes a book to fall to the floor when I drop it. Spiritual power is released when we pray. Mm-hmm. And I'm just kind of hanging on to that, like, because sometimes I don't know how to pray. And, and, and in my crisis of belief, a while for a while I had quit praying Mm -hmm. um and prayer had has always kind of been a fretful worrying time for me it was a time to fret before the Lord and worry Mm -hmm. and it was exhausting Mm -hmm. and I didn't like praying and I um you know I was basically just begging God to follow my desires and focus most I was just focusing on the outcome of the prayer Mm mm-hmm a friend has been sharing some things that she's learned through her own suffering with me. And one of the most helpful things that I've adopted, and it's just really simple, air of surrender. And I just literally say, Jesus, I surrender it all to you. Take care of everything. Mm-hmm. And I might say that 10 times a day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, I don't even know what to ask you for right now. I don't know how this could possibly work out. Mm-hmm. You know, just tiny little situations and surrender. I just know is the only thing that brings peace, like nothing else can. It's truly just letting go of all my attempts to control. Like my hands are open, Mm -hmm. not just clutching on tightly to what the outcome I want, the way I want. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a funny story about John had in order to be enrolled in this phase one clinical trial. He had to have a lot of lab work done, and all of his numbers had to be within certain pretty tight ranges. Mm-hmm. And he had one number that was out of the range, and they said, we cannot enroll you in the trial until that number comes down, because that's how the FDA had approved it. Like, these people had to fit fit this profile. So they said, oh, it's been coming down, so we'll wait over the weekend. We'll probably start you on Monday on the trial. But when we go Monday, the number had actually gone up, mm-hmm. not down. Mm-hmm. And, oh, I was just, I kind of had a freak out moment. I was just crushed. Like, we had people praying for this number to come down. I was just begging God. And 
you know, I started to question, God, why, why, you know, and I caught myself because once again, we were right in the middle of Genesis. We had just read about Sarah and Abraham and I caught myself saying, why can't they just fudge that number? It was like a 10th of a percent. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Or I thought they could use my blood because mine's probably perfect. That's right. (laughs) Just just get him in the study. And on the way home, I said, oh my goodness, I'm kind of like Sarah saying, hey, Abraham, go have a child with my maidservant, Hagar. Right. 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 And John and John goes, well, not quite the same. <laughs> but, yeah. but you'd be willing if that's what it took. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I just realized, though, my desperate yeah. desire to take back control and make things happen mm-hmm. in my timing. And now here we are today. We're shut up in our home. On the second day of a snowstorm, John was supposed to have treatment on Tuesday. They shut the clinic down for snow. So he thought, well, the next day they shut the clinic down for snow. Mm -hmm. So all I can say is Jesus, take care of everything. Like I'm not praying, Lord, he's got to start on Thursday because that'll be too long if he doesn't. Or Mm -hmm. what if the chemo doesn't work now because he's off the regiment? What if, what if he gets kicked out of the trial? Like I don't even go there anymore. Like it's just. Jesus, Mm -hmm. I surrender it all to you. Please take care of everything. And I don't even know what that outcome would be. Right. You know, it's just, it just doesn't matter anymore. It's just open hand. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. A verse that's been really helpful um, to me is Isaiah 43, 2 and 3. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the waters, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. You know, that verse says, through the waters, in the waters, through the fire, in the fire. And like I said a minute ago, most of my prayers have been begging for a bridge over those troubled waters, hmm. not not through them. And, in, and I think in all fairness, Jesus modeled that too. Like, if there could be any other way, please grant it. Mm-hmm. But Lord, if not, grant me the ability to accept this. And then something that Elizabeth Elliot said, and even beyond that, like, help me to anticipate the glorious way that you will work it out someday. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's just hard to, Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we can't see it. Right. Can't imagine it. Right. But that's what I would like to cling to is to look for the way and anticipate the, right. the ways that he's going to be with me and the ways he's going to prepare us and John and our family and how he's going to work through the whole, the whole situation. Mm-hmm. And Julie, I know that like there's so many people that are praying for you and so many people that want to support you in this. And we had talked about how can you support someone in a situation like this? What is helpful? Because I'm also doing the Bible recap and when you look at Job and Job's friends, they're always held up as not the kind of friends to be. They're not helpful. Right. They're not supportive. So what would be a good friend in this situation? Well, I mean, we've had just an outpouring of love and support from people, people wanting to do things and meals provided. And and those are all, I mean, we just really, really appreciate all of that. Um you know, just texts and cards and phone calls. I've had flowers dropped off on my front doorstep, um, gifts. I mean, th- but those things aren't, I mean, those are like above and over mm-hmm. more than we could ever ask for. But I guess just to not be afraid to just uh, text and, and you know, not feel like you have to have something original or new to say. Mm-hmm. It's not that that I'm looking for. It's just a reminder that you're thinking about us that, because I know life does go on and that that's hard to see life going on. And ours is kind of at a, at a standstill. Like Mm -hmm. John's not working. He can't work Mm -hmm. and he, he may never work, you know, like this, Mm -hmm. this may be it. And, um, just a, a reminder, like when I get texts throughout the day that people are thinking about us, that means more than you would ever know. Um, and, and, you know, and you could say the same thing every time. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't have to mm-hmm. be new and original. And um, 
and and I'll just boast about Marie here. <laughs> Marie has called around to get information about painting my cabinets. Like I have new cabinet doors coming in, which I don't even want anymore, but they're paid for and they're coming in and they're unpainted. And so she took took it on herself to call and find out information about that. Um, John's supposed to go in for treatment and we're in the middle of a snowstorm. So she called and got drivers lined up, you know, because I was afraid to drive him. So those are just very practical needs. And I really appreciate that. Um, one friend just said, I wasn't having a good day. And she goes, I'm just going to come over. And I was like, oh, no, you live so far. Like, you don't have to do that. And she goes, no, I'm, I'm coming over. And she said, I'll just sit with you or we can walk. So we actually went on a walk and she just literally took me by the arm and said, I am here to do the whole thing. Like, I'm not going to let you walk through this alone, literally or figuratively. <laughs> and I think just this is really awkward because I know I experienced it this summer in front of my friend whose husband was sick with COVID. Like to just watch somebody kind of fall apart is very hard, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily need any words. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they just need you to be there. Yeah. There's not going to be anything that we can say that's going to take it away or even really make it better. No. Only by, we can only offer the fact that we're there. Right. And uh, I, I mean, I've had friends that I haven't seen in 20 or 30 years texting me daily and, you know, friends from pharmacy school or friends that live in other states. And that is just really, it really means a lot. And and John has too. And, you know, John is a people person. He really likes conversation and text. It, it doesn't bother him. Now, not late at night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he does go to bed early now, but, um, you know, he just, he does like to know people are thinking about him and he gets, mm -hmm. I can see a lift in him when he's talking on the phone with an old friend or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. My friend who almost lost her husband to COVID this summer has become friends with a doctor at Vanderbilt. And he has written an acrostic for acceptance. He's a believer. And he's kind of been helping her through some of this. And, you know, each letter, A, C, C, E, P, T, A, N, C, E, he's written something out for each letter. And I was just going to read a couple of them because they have been very helpful for me. Mm -hmm. One, the, the end, I won't read them in order, but the N in acceptance was normalize your struggles. And I thought of you, you Mindy, when you said you didn't feel normal. Um, one of the C's is create a vision for a rich life that can coexist with difficulties, reminding yourself that your life can be full right now. That having a life of wholeness and satisfaction isn't contingent on the absence of challenges. And that's mm -hmm. the way I've thought my whole life. Mm -hmm. It's either everything's all good mm -hmm. or there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another C was cut ties with a highly idealized view of the past that makes your current situation seem dire and unacceptable by comparison. Mm -hmm. The T, try to remember that the struggles that you feel are often temporary and time limited though they seem terrifying and real in the, more, in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, try not to give them more power than they, than they should have. Mm -hmm. And E, explore the world around you and realize that you're not alone in your struggles, that there are people you love and respect and aspire to be like who are suffering too. Mm -hmm. So I'd like, we could, we could share this in the show notes. It's um, Acceptance by Dr. James Jackson, psychology, psychologist, Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He wrote okay. it. Yeah. 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 I think that's so wise, you know, and, and I tend to do this too. I think we all tend to either think everything is going really well or everything's falling apart if one little thing's wrong. And I do think that it's, it's wise of him to point out that you can live a full life and be happy in the midst of challenges because that's really, it's hard to grasp. Yeah. It's a lot to put on yourself to try to make your life challenge free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't, you can't do that. And um, it doesn't leave much time for any joy if you're waiting on everything to get better. <laughs> right. Right. You know. Well, thank you, Julie, for opening up and sharing. I know that that is not easy. I did want to share this because for a couple of reasons, just that I, I may not be on the podcast as much if, you know, just depending on what my day's like or what's going on with John. Uh, so I wanted people to understand that. And also just, um, I got a card from um, a lady that I've never met. Mm -hmm. I, do, I do know who she is, but I've never met her. And I had no idea that she listened to our podcast. And she said she had listened to every episode and that she just considered us to be friends. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if, if we have friends out there, I, I just want friends to share in what I'm going through. Mm-hmm. Um, because what I've learned is there are a lot of people out there that want to pray, that want to encourage and support um, that don't even know me that well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that is a real blessing. So I, it just, that kind of inspired me to want to share that today, just to share this today. So, right. Yeah. I mean, how do we transition from here, listeners? It's not like we can go into I'm a fan. Um, you know, this is a serious episode, but we do want you as listeners to know that we value the time that you take every week to tune into Midlife Matters. And we don't often share what's really going on behind the scenes if we feel like it might be too tough, but these are things that can't be ignored. You know, loss mm-hmm. of jobs, moving illnesses, um, you know, really, really hard diagnoses. These are things that hit not only us at Midlife Matters, but also you guys out there listening. And so hopefully by hearing Mindy and Julie today, there may be other people who are encouraged who are going through a hard time. And, you know, we don't often do this either. But if you want us to pray for you, or you have a situation that you are really struggling with, email us at midlifematterspodcast at gmail.com. We would be happy to lift you up and Mm -hmm. to share in your burden. We know there are people out there walking through hard things. Yeah, I'd like to end with this one verse. Um, It's Psalm 2510. And it says, all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. And all has to mean all, um, not all but pancreatic cancer, or not all but divorce, right. or not all but moving and job mm-hmm. loss. Like, all has to mean all. And that is a verse I'm also clinging to right now. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Mindy and Julie, thank you guys for sharing. I know that we'll be talking about these things more in the future. And listeners, we thank you for tuning in today. We're so happy you joined us today. You can find the show notes for this episode at midlifematterspodcast.com. Also, please tell a friend about the show and help them hit the free subscribe button on their favorite podcast app. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Midlife Matters Podcast. That's where we post pictures and stories about all the things we talk about in each episode. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.